Hi, Pastor Craig. I am so excited about our topic today because I have big questions and I know you always have amazing answers. So welcome, Pastor Craig Rochelle. Well, Lisa, it's great to be back with you. I always, uh, always enjoy our time together. It's just terrific to have you here today. And it's so terrific to get to spend some time talking about your new book, The Power to Change. And I'm going to actually hold the book up. I wish we had a mirror copy so that everyone could see a mirrored copy. If you're joining by just listening today, it's a awesome orange cover that has big, bold white letters, The Power to Change by Craig Rochelle, who is, by the way, New York Times bestselling author. And like I said before, pastor of Life Church. So let's just jump right in. What motivated you to write this book? So interesting uh, enough, Lisa, the um, the theme of this book, I think, is maybe um, perhaps the most core theme to my life. It's, it's really all about choosing discipline. And I, I wanted to write a book on discipline, but the publisher said, nobody wants to hear about discipline. So it's, uh, so we wrote about the power to change, which really talks about how do we create the right habits and the right disciplines in our life to bring about the right outcomes? I, I think a lot of times we get so focused on the outcome that this is you know, what I want to do or who I want to become that we don't know how to get there and get really frustrated. So the book is about how to create um, the right inputs in our lives that will bring about the God-honoring outcomes. Because I know for me, I'm just going to make a couple of, of confessions on this podcast, if that's okay. That's a way, please. Okay. I like the thought of change, but when it comes down to breaking it down into the daily disciplines and new habits that I need to form to create lasting change, sometimes I get highly unmotivated. Mm -hmm. So highly motivated, want the change, but unmotivated in creating what's necessary to bring about the change. So what do you say to people who say, I want change, um, but I just don't know that I can do this. Well, I think that that's very common for all of us that it's really, really easy to want um, a specific outcome or, or to make a uh, change in our life. But the work to get there can be very, very intimidating. And so what I would say, first of all, is that change is possible, that that all things are possible with God, that the power of the gospel, at the heart of it is it changes lives. So change is possible. And then what I would do is, is really try to start um, encouraging people on some really, really small, simple changes that a lot of times, Lisa, people look at, they, they might look at your life and say, I want what Lisa has, she's had, probably had to do all these big, big things. And you would actually say, no, the, you know, any kind of God honoring success you have is a result of small, consistent actions that bring about the big results. It's, I would say it's the small things that no one sees that bring about the big results that everybody wants. And so I would break it down and we can talk about really how to do it. Uh, to break down the your your life into its, the small, consistent habits that will bring about the big changes. So it is possible, and it doesn't have to be big, big changes. It can be small changes over time that bring about um, really big um, differences in your life. Yeah, so I resonate so much with what you're saying because it when someone ever says to me like, oh, how does it feel to experience such overnight success? <laughs> right. yeah. And I'm like, yes, overnight success, 30 years in the making. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, I've been doing this a long time and I know you have as well. And um, so many times what I say to people, especially when they ask me questions about ministry is I say it was a daily act of obedience. Like I realized early on, my job is to be obedient to God with what's in front of me. And God's job is everything else. And I think that that answer is very true to the what I experienced. And there were also many decisions that I made along the way that were really wise decisions. So what would you say when someone's wanting to create a change in their life? Are there some decisions that they need to make first in order to start the process of healthier habits and and new discipline 100 so here's what tends to happen people will say like I, you know i want to um be more organized or i want to be healthier uh or i want to um be a better parent or be more present or whatever and they start with the uh kind of exterior or, or outside goal what i would say lisa is we have to start with um 
the core reasons why we behave the way that we do. And if you think about it, if if we were to ask kind of your um, podcast community, why do you do what you do? There would be several kind of what I call secondary reasons. People do what they do to be liked or to feel responsible or maybe to be God honoring. But when you, we, when you take away all the secondary reasons, the primary reason that people do what they do is this. You do what you do because of what you think of you. If you think of yourself as organized, you tend to behave like someone who's organized. If you think of yourself as someone who procrastinates, you become someone that procrastinates. So identity drives behavior. So what I would do is I would start with not the behavior, how do I want to behave, but I would start with the identity and say, who do you want to become? Who is it that you want to be? And we want to start with a God honoring identity. And then when we start to change what we think of ourselves. If, if you want to change what you do, change what you think of you, right? We're going to not see ourselves as someone else says we are, or even as our own negative voices say that we are, but we're going to try to see ourselves as God says we are, or how he sees us, and change our identity. Once we start to see ourselves as that, we can name, this is who I want to become. This is the type of person that I want to be. Then we're going to ask, what kind of behaviors does that kind of person uh, have? And we're going to look at what kind of habit do we want to start to become that type of person? What kind of habit do we want to stop? But it all starts with identity. Who do you want to be? Before? Let's talk about who before do. And once we identify the who, the do will start to overflow more naturally. I like that so much because I think I sometimes, here's another confession by me. I think sometimes I put limitations on myself that I don't even realize affect my behavior more than than I've given it credit for. We all, or we all do that. I think I, I think everybody does that. It's our own our our own um inner insecurities will often rob us from any kind of real potential. Yeah. So here are a couple examples in my life. Um I'll start with something super small, but actually it creates a lot of drama in my life. A lot. But it's I just constantly lose my cell phone. And I mean, it's it's a problem. Like people in my life know, they say at, whenever we leave somewhere, my people know, like ask Lisa if she has her phone How funny. because chances are I will have forgotten it. And even and so I, I think I've even bought into this thing. It's like, yeah, you know, I'm just the person who always loses her cell phone. But I wonder if how much of it is that my thinking has been so limited because I say that, mm. that it, ha- it hasn't even occurred to me to make that a change yes. or to do different habits in my life to create a change. I'm just navigating around the dysfunction of losing my phone all the yes. time, you know? And so that's a small example, but then there's much bigger examples in our life where we put limitations on ourselves and we label ourselves. this is just how I am. Like, I like the one where you said, you know, if someone says they want to be a more organized person, well, I, I, I've heard people say before, well, I'm just not that organized. And it's like, yeah, you may not be right now, but what could happen if you change that thinking? So what would you say to someone who just feels stuck? Well, I'd say again, that's, that's fairly common. And back to your illustration, I think number one, we can probably find, uh, and several solutions to help you find your cell phone. And, uh, and we, we might even work on that together because I think that's a solvable problem. But I think that everybody feels stuck at, uh, at one time or another. We feel like this is just the way uh, that I am and I, and I can't change. So if we start to identify what is it that, you know, what type of a person do we want to become? Who do we want to be? And then we ask ourselves this, if uh, based on who I want to become, what's one habit that I need to create? Or what's one behavior that I want to, to start? And what's so amazing is like with your cell phone, like let's just say you created a checklist, uh, you know, before you left somewhere, you're going to say every time, you know, do I have my cell phone? Uh, because you're the type of person that never loses her cell phone. And, and if you create that one behavior that moves in that direction, then what happens is, as James Clear says, you start creating like many votes, li- little small votes toward the type of person that you want to become. And your actions start to confirm uh, your identity. Uh, I'm the type of person that never leaves her cell phone. 
And so before you leave, you say, do I have my cell phone? You get it and you say, oh, I'm, I'm the type of person who never does it. So what we're going to do is if we feel stuck and, and change is way too far off in the distance, we're going to take really small, really intentional steps in that direction. And over time, it can be a big change. I'll give you a personal example. If sometimes people say you're like, hey, Craig, you're, you're a very disciplined person. And I would say, like naturally I am not at all. I like to eat junk food. I like to sleep in. I like to take shortcuts. Really? I, I, a thousand percent. I love donuts, oh. chocolate cake, cinnamon rolls, sweet tea, chips. The list goes on and on and on. So by nature, I don't have good disciplines, but I decided years ago to do a really small thing. And in the book, um, the Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. He talks about keystone habits, what little habits that create cascading positive habits. I decided, it's kind of funny, but just to start flossing because I hate flossing. And by doing one thing a day that I don't like, it tells myself, okay, I'm choosing to do, to, I'm choosing to be disciplined. I'm choosing to do something that I don't want to do. And that one little discipline creates all sorts of other positive disciplines in my life. The way I joke about it, at least, is I'll say, because I floss, I say I'm disciplined and that helps me to eat better, go to bed early, get up early, do my Uversion Bible plan, get into the office early, be productive, come home early, see Amy and have an amazing life. Versus if I didn't, I would think, okay, I'm not disciplined. I don't eat good. I stay up too late. I sleep in. I don't do my Bible study. I get in late. I'm a jerk all day. I'm running late coming home. I get pulled over by a police officer. I don't want to get a ticket. So I try to outrun him. I end up in jail all because I didn't floss. So Obviously, a <laughs> little bit of an exaggeration, but not too far from the truth that one small behavior reinforces the positive identity that I'm disciplined and that starts creating um, other positive traits. So that's why I say don't be discouraged. You can do something really, really small in the right direction based on who I want to become. What one new habit do I need to start? And you'll be shocked at how quickly you can change and never lose your cell phone again. I know that would be a full on miracle. That would that would be truly miraculous. It's so bad. I just went on a bus trip, like a bus tour across the United States. And um, the number of times I left my cell phone, lost my cell phone or watched the Uber driving down the highway because I was tracking my cell phone and realized I'm on the bus and there goes my cell phone. So and, you know, it seems like something so small and so silly, but the drama that it creates is enormous. Yes. So I like the example you just gave about flossing your teeth. And if you play it all the way out, it's helping you not get arrested. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, you know, that may seem dramatic, but I do think it's true. Do you think that some of us are are just not thinking about playing it all the way out when we're thinking about daily habits, which seems hard to create. But if we do take the time and play it all the way out with those habits, this can happen. Without those habits, this can happen. Talk to me about that. Well, it's the uh, there's a great book called uh, The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy, and and basically he shows how you know really small behaviors in any direction create massive change. And there was one example in there, and I, I hate to talk about weight because weight can be sensitive. We, we really are concerned about health, but he talk, he shows in the book how um, 125 calories a day, one way or the other, creates a real compound effect. And that could be, you know, what is that, a glass of wine or, a, you know, maybe a half of a candy bar or whatever, something really small. And if someone adds just 125 calories over a 27 month period with no other changes, that person gains 33 and a half pounds, 33 and a half pounds, but just 125 extra calories a day. And the flip side is if someone eliminates that very thing and decreases and nothing else changes 125 calories, it, it becomes a 33 and a half pound um, drop. And so there's literally a 67 pound swing based on something as small as a portion of a candy bar a day. And that's to me is, is, you know, I don't, again, I don't want to harp on um, weight or calories, but use that as an example of think about what would be different if you prayed with your spouse every day. How could that create changes in your marriage? Or think about mm -hmm. if you spent less than you make every day and invested just $10 a week into a long-term investment. And, and so if we can make really, really small changes 
over time, they can create a massive difference. Like for example, I've been married for 31 years to Amy. If you, um, if someone would look on and say, you guys have a really good marriage, why is it? I could probably list four or five very small things that we've worked to consistently have in our marriage that over time create something special. And without those four or five things, we could be in an entirely different place. It's not the big few things you do, it's the small, consistent, right things you do over time that bring about really, really special results. I love that. Um, so tell me what are those four or five things or just name four or five things that you and Amy consistently do that you think are really helping to improve your relationship and keep it growing. So, the, the, and, and again, what I'm gonna tell you, like these things are true, I promise you, and they all seem really small. One of the things that we do is is we pray together and we don't pray long, but here, here's the thing. If we pray together, do you think that we can fight and pray together? The answer is no. We have to work through issues to pray together. Uh, do you think that it would be easy to have a um, secret sin going on and, and have intimate spiritual time together? The answer is no. And so it, it forces, um, you, you know, a, um, a real God-honoring, God-submitted, heart of purity in order to pray together. So something that small creates something really, really big, it creates spiritual intimacy, um, and it helps us work through things. Another little bitty thing is that we do walks together. And this wouldn't necessarily be important to someone else, but to us with six children and a lot of moving parts, it's about the only guarded time we have to really process things. And so Amy loves face-to-face -face time. I have a more difficult time having long, intimate face-to-face -face talks, but when we're side-by-side -side doing something out in, in nature, I get real, real open. And so we work through things that way. Um, we have had a, a date night for years and years and years, and and just, we had we had one season where we thought, our marriage is good, we don't need a date night. And suddenly, our marriage wasn't as good anymore. And then I think just the, um, the it, it, we're pastors, but we're not just pastors, we're Christians. We, we worship together, meaning we're, in a small group and we're in the church together and i'd say if you take those little things and they wouldn't be the same for everybody but those little things keep us spiritually humble spiritually repentant spiritually intimate relationally close prioritizing each other not being child-centered in our marriage having a relationship grounded on christ working through issues the presence of those four or five things create a really good marriage, the absence of those things could create an entirely different um, scenario. Mm, that's really good. I love those suggestions because none of them feel massive. No. You know, if you say to someone, you need to work on your relationship, that feels so massive. It's like, well, where do we even start? There's communication, there's conflict, there's you know, like there's so many different aspects of working on a relationship. But what I hear you saying is just work on it daily. Yes. Pick some of those small things that are good daily habits that you can implement. And then over time, change will happen. Yes. I really like actually the weight example because I had bought into the lie when um, I hit 50 mm -hmm. And I just thought, well, after 50, it's just not really possible to lose weight or, you know, get healthy. There were changes happening um, just with hormones and everything in my body. And so I kind of bought this lie of just settling in and just accepting the weight. And obviously, my primary goal is to be healthy. But I knew that I had gained weight and that I wasn't feeling healthy. I just wasn't. And um, so I decided to go after portion control. Now, I've done a ton of different diets over my life, you know, lots of different eating plans, lots of different exercise plans. And, you know, I'll, I think eating plans and exercise plans, I think they're good. They're really good. But what I discovered is portion control for me was the key to having that compounding effect that you were talking about and just reducing a certain number of calories a day and giving up something that really wasn't necessary, wasn't healthy for me, it made a massive difference. And in one year's time, I lost over 50 pounds. Wow. Mm -hmm. So I went from kind of believing that like, this is where I'm at and I'll be here forever to making a change, which was a very daily change. And it didn't seem that massive. 
but um, but it really did help in a tremendously massive way. And I now have so much more energy. Mm-hmm. I'm better equipped to run at the pace that my ministry life requires. And I just, in general, feel better about myself. Now, that's not to say I'm not standing in front of the mirror body shaming myself, and I'm not shaming someone else. But for me, that mathematical equation of doing something small every single day, it did add up to a big, massive change. That's so powerful. And I would guess, Lisa, that not only did it give you more energy to do the ministry, um, but I'm guessing that it had compounding positive effects in other areas of your life. For example, number one is you proved to yourself that you could do something that you didn't think you could do. And so that that creates confidence. And there may be some other area of your life, I'm guessing, that you didn't think you could accomplish it. And that momentum um, in the area of your physical health gave you the confidence to attack something else. And it, it's it, and that's what we're looking for. W- whatever age we are, whatever relationship we're in, we want to do the right things, the right small things at that season to be the best version of who God created us to be. And if it's yeah, if it's um, in your 50s, if it's in your 70s, if it's in your 20s, whatever it is, is we're going to do the right things to become who it is that God wants us to become. And I applaud you for that. And I know that that's not just something that impacted your health, but I promise you, it, your ministry is better because of it. Your relationships are better because of it. You've got, you've got momentum in other areas of life because you found um, a God-honoring discipline in one area. Yeah, I agree with that. So are there some changes that you recommend people start with? Like, you know, if they're coming to you and saying, okay, Pastor Craig, I want to be a healthier person or I want to be a happier person. Are there some basic changes you see kind of across the board that people need to consider first? Because I think a lot of us could change a lot of things about ourselves. So to prevent overwhelm happening, what would you say are good places to start? So that's a great question. I've got a lot to say about it. I'll try to keep it short. The, The first thing I would say is this, that a lot of times we're tending to think about all change as practical. What I would do is I would encourage people to think of change as spiritual, that we're not just after behavior modification. Uh, what we're after is spiritual transformation. Because if we simply change a behavior without changing our heart, the behavior tends to come back, right? We see, we see that all the time. Uh, right. We do good for 30 days and then we fall back into the old patterns. So I would say, Let's start as often as we can, not with behavior modification, but saying we truly want spiritual transformation that God's going to change our heart. Once we start there, then what I would do is I would try to help people say, okay, who do you want to become? Remember, we're starting with who before do. We're starting with identity before behavior. Then I would move to real specific questions, and everybody's answer would be different. But I would ask you, based on who you want to become, what one habit do you need to start or based on who you want to become, what one habit do you need to break? And the reason I say one is because most people try to change five things and nobody can change five things at once, but anybody can change one thing. So if you change one thing, you're creating positive momentum. Then I teach on a very different mindset that I believe is really rooted in scripture. Uh, The apostle Paul said, train yourself for godliness. He said, I train my body to do what it should. Most people, when they're hoping to change, they're just trying to change. And I would say to people, stop trying to change. If you're trying, what does it mean to be trying? Trying is kind of like a half-hearted attempt where you know you might not succeed and you're already giving yourself uh, uh, an excuse to fail. I'm trying, but I may not make it. What we're doing is we're not trying, but we're in training. Totally different mindset. If you're in training, you have a game plan, you're going to show up, you may not always have a great training day, and you may even skip a day, or you may even blow your training session. But when you're training, you're actually becoming more of what you already are. I'm training to get better at what I am. I'm not trying to become something, but I'm in training. So Lisa, you are the type of person that never loses her cell phone. (laughs) And, And what does a person like that do? I don't know, but there's one thing that you, that type of person does or one thing they don't do, and you're going to name what that is. And then you're not trying to be to not lose your cell phone. You're in training. Every day you get up, you got a plan. Before you leave anywhere, do I have my cell phone or whatever it is? Or there's probably some technology that can solve that problem immediately for you. 
if you get the device that tracks it, but that would be way too easy. Uh, but we're, we are, we have our identity. We know what we're one thing we want to start or one thing we want to stop. And we're, we're, we're not, we're not trying, we're in training and God is spiritually transforming our heart. And it's, it changes possible, whatever it is that you think you can't change with God's help, with his power, you can change. I like that so much because I would imagine when someone's trying to make a change in their life and that requires them to have different, a different mindset and a different um, daily habits, then I think other people could sometimes be resistant to that because it may affect them. Mm -hmm. For example, like if someone says they want to get healthier and then their spouse is frustrated, like, wait, no, we, we go out and eat, right. you know, pizza every Thursday night. And now you're saying you want to go get, you know, grilled chicken salads. And the spouse may be like, no, you know, this is too complicated. But I like, instead of saying, I'm trying to the, mm -hmm. to do this, I'm in training to do this. And I think that could help other people even have a different mindset about the changes that we're making that may affect them as well. Right. That's a good point. And, uh, and they can be more supportive. And, and that's a whole nother side point. But the people that we're around matter so, so, so much. And if we're around all, um, it, the, the majority of people we're around have really different habits, what would be dangerous to us. We might want to love them, but not spend as much time with them. We might, we might need to redefine the relationships. Obviously, if you're married, you know, you don't just redefine that one because, you know, you're, you are, you are married. Uh, but sometimes if spouses are going in different ways, if we can help, you know, help our spouse see this is why we're going this way, then he or she can be more supportive rather than antagonistic toward it. And a lot of times what will happen is when one spouse makes a positive change, the, and does it right, the other one will come along as well. And then you'll see two people moving in the same direction. And that can get really special because you become a support for each other rather than uh, a, a opposition toward that goal. I love that. Okay. Two last questions. Yes. One, what are some of the most important daily habits that you've developed to invest wisely in your six kids that have now multiplied because yes. so many of them are married. Now you have grandkids. Same with me. Yes. So with my six kids, there, there, here's some, um, this is a really big question. Uh, a couple of things that are, it's more of like a mindset. One thing is I study how they connect. There's six of them and they all connect in a different way. Kate, Katie, my oldest, she'll be real intimate and open um, in the written word. Uh, Mandy likes to talk, but there's only certain times of the day she likes to talk. Anna, um, likes to talk about what's going on in her world, and I have to know what's going on in, in her world. Sam, he'll talk anytime, anywhere, anytime, anywhere it, it, with him. Steven, I, you have to do, I have to like play catch with him or do some kind of side by side action for a long period of time before he opens up, then he won't stop. Uh, Joy, it's always going to be in her moment, in her time. And so, what I do is with six kids, I know how they connect, and I very intentionally look for opportunities to connect with them in those ways. Then what I do is I have I created midway through my parenting a rule that I try to live by, and that is when they ask me to do something, which a lot of times I'll go a long time and none of them will ask me to do anything, but if they ask me, can you do something or do you want to do something, if it's all humanly possible, I'm going to drop everything I can and engage in that moment. Obviously, you may not do that when they're three years old, but when they get older, and you're talking with teenagers and such, I want to be completely available when they initiate to try to meet that moment. Because if I don't, those moments come and they go. Um, the biggest goal with them is to lead with grace, 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 and always communicate truth. In a lot of Christians' homes, sometimes it's more truth than grace, and truth without grace tends to lead to rebellion. Uh, grace without truth tends to lead to license. So what I want to do is I want to keep the conversation open, do everything I can to have them talking, be available to them, and then always lead with grace um, and then um, support grace with truth. And I'm super thankful. I can't take credit for it at all, but that six of them are actively serving Jesus in the church is by the grace of God and the help of a good church, good community, um, and and a lot of answered prayers that they're on the right track. And um, I'm super thankful for that. That doesn't tend to happen naturally 
it takes a lot of intentionality and a lot of grace, right? I think the there's so much power in consistency because, you know, when you talk about a topic as big as parenting or a topic as big as marriage, there it, it could be easy to say, well, I do 15 things. And it's like, uh, but can you consistently do 15 things, right. you know, with six kids? Not really. But I love that you've boiled it down to what you have determined are two really important things. And I absolutely love your suggestion. My mantra in parenting was keep them talking. Yes, yes. Just keep yes. them talking. Because, you know, sometimes people are raised and it's a, you know, where we say, don't talk back to me mm-hmm. or because I said so. And I think that there is a definite good part of that in terms of we want to teach our kids to be respectful. But I wanted to have respectful kids who at the same time wanted to keep the conversation going. And so my big thing was keep them talking, I keep agree. them talking. You know what I had to do? Like I had to train my facial expressions to not have a reaction that would shut the conversation down. So I trained my face to just be like, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Tell me more about that. Help me understand. Inside, I may be freaking out. Like, don't you dare think that right. way, you know? But I think keep them talking. It's kind of similar to what you said. I think it's brilliant. Um, yes. So I love that. Okay. As we wrap up, is there anything that you haven't shared about the book that you'd want to share or what is your favorite part of the book? I would say my favorite part of the book is uh, at the end where we just talk about the, that God's part in it, that a lot of times we really, really focus on, I have to do this and it's gonna, this is going to be hard and I'm not going to be able to do it. But the reality is that that God's power, His grace is absolutely and completely with you. And in whatever area right now you feel like you can't change, that's an area where you're weak. And the amazing thing is that God's strength is absolutely available and is made perfect in your weakness. And I know we're kind of kind of I'm kind of joking about the phone, but I'm really not because I know if you lose your phone on a trip, it is a big, big, big deal. And so I would just, I, like, I'm dead serious. I'd almost want to talk to you about this off camera and and solve this once and for all, that you're Lisa Turkers, you're the type of person that doesn't lose her phone. And because you're that type of person, what one new habit do you need to create or what one thing do you need to change? And let's just come up with whatever that is. And then you're not trying to be this kind of person, but you're in training to be this. And then the reality is God's going to meet you where you are in this weakness and it'll become a strength and like i literally believe you could become you could have like i've gone two years and never lost my phone because that's the type of person you are that your ministry role is too important your impact in this world is too significant to be stopped by something as small as a lost phone so i agree i need you to hold me accountable I, so yeah. just I don't. I, 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 we we all need to hold you accountable. This is a solvable problem for Lisa Turkus with all that you have going on, and uh, and I, th- just for fun, like like if you can give me now, like what one thing do you need to do, or what do you need to stop? Can you give me one thing? Let's just start with one thing, just for fun. Okay, I think what I need to do regarding the cell phone as is, I need to when I put it down, I need to say out loud, "I am putting my phone on my dresser." Okay, there you go. And or if I get in an Uber. I am putting my phone in my purse. And I think if I say it out loud, it'll clue my brain to engage because I think what happens is my brain is thinking of, you know, 15 other different things. And so my cell phone just becomes something that I'll just set it here and I'm not even paying attention. And that's a big so reason done, why I'm losing done. it. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I got my private pilot's license last year and right now I'm training for my instrument rating and I'm almost finished with it. And we say everything out loud, every checklist, everything that we're doing, we say out loud because it brings to the front of your consciousness what you're doing. And what happens is we catch ourselves making mistakes or forgetting something by saying things out loud. That's brilliant. That's part of your life now. Like that's one habit that you need to create. When you do that, that's going to reinforce your identity that you're the type of person that doesn't lose her phone and you're going to eliminate a lot of stress you're not trying to do that. You're in training and God's going to meet you in it. That he truly, and this is, you know, does God really care about something that small? He actually does because that creates big drama 
in your life that's unnecessary, that's going to slow you down from creating a bigger impact. And so he's going to meet you in that. Um, I would just declare right now to the Lisa Turkhurst podcast community <laughs> <laughs> that we're going places. You got the power to change and uh, creating the habits that matter most in your life. And so I am going to, as your friend um, and partner in uh, cell phone identification, uh, check back up with you and we're going we're gonna to crush this one. <laughs> that is great. And all the people that do life with me said, amen, for Let's sure. Well, as we wrap up, thank you for that, by the way, I do think like it is, it does seem like a small thing, but it's not a small promise, thing. Promise it's, you'll do that. Just promise me you'll do that. That one little thing. I will. Watch. I will. Go. I will. Okay. okay. Let me share it with everyone one more time. The power to change why I love this book. And it's because sometimes when I'm reading a book that is more business oriented or more personal development oriented, sometimes I gravitate toward the popular books that address this from a psychological standpoint or, you know, a business standpoint or whatever. And, and then I have to choose, okay, do I want to read a Christian book or do I want to read a development book? But I love the fact that we get it all with you. You are an incredible leader and you are solid in your faith. And whether you're running a household, whether you are in charge of a committee, whether you are just wanting to improve yourself, or certainly if you are running an organization, I recommend The Power to Change. And I love the subtitle too, Mastering the Habits That Matter Most. I think it's a crucial book for all of us to read. Let's make this the year that we make some of those changes that we all have said we wanted to make, but we just haven't activated those changes yet. So the power to change. Pastor Craig Rochelle, thank you. Amazing conversation today and good challenge. So I receive your challenge. <laughs>